how would you put quantum physics on sound foundations? What for you would be the significance of quantum probability theory? And how would you situate that with classical probability theory? John Harlan leads our Math for Wisdom physics study group. Uh, he has a passion for physics and a PhD in functional analysis. He is tutoring me in this video about the classical preliminaries for all these questions, uh, focusing as we go along on the uh, two-split experiment from the point of view of classical statistical mechanics and mathematically trying to show that uh, that's insufficient uh, for dealing with the inspirations of quantum physics, which uh, the first being that we get wave-like behavior from the two sources that are coming in. They're, um, they have a diffraction and they have destructive interference and constructive interference. And the second being that when you do a measurement which uh, yields results in a collection of states, then reapplying that measurement gives you the same kinds of results in the same collection of states. So uh, that uh, reapplying the measurement is basically like doing the measurement once. And so he's talking about this, though, as much as he can from the classical point of view, trying to be very careful um, with his mathematical expertise not to make claims uh, that he does not think are well-founded in terms of that distinction. He actually has a very broad view of classical uh, physics, uh, and he thinks it's actually more general than uh, quantum physics. So when he's coming to Lithuania, and we're going to have lots to talk about. We've been studying together for three years, uh, and we're looking uh, from his point of view uh, how to develop an extra dynamical evolutionary system that would give the satisfactory foundations he seeks, which involves uh, two by two matrices that are coming up, I think, for me in my study of bot periodicity and uh, how... Um, perspectives are placed upon symmetric spaces, yielding um, more and more structure, breaking symmetry, but how cognitive frameworks restore that symmetry uh, when you reassemble those perspectives. So we have excitement to connect with. This video may not be so exciting if, if you're not in that mode, uh, but you may be the person who would like to work with us. We're looking for you. That's why we're publishing this video. I am Andres Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. And I, you know, this is not really lecture form. I'm not really prepared to make a coherent, um, uh, you know, um, We'll explore lecture, together. Lecture, lecture that flow that flows like a lecture. It's more of a discussion, and I think Andres and I are, are going to sort of discover this. Uh, you know, we're going to rediscover. In, in well, he's going to rediscover. It, it, and we're going to we're going to hash it out. It's a working session. It's a working session, not a lecture. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. And this is a way to kind of like have foundations of quantum mechanics, quantum physics in mind. So John thought I should uh, know about this. Yeah, because you're, you know, all the stuff you talk about um, with, uh, you know, about periodicity mm -hmm. and... Um, Orthogonal Schaeffer polynomials. All that stuff kind of, I think, you know, I think this will, this context will help. Um, and, and certainly the orthogonal Sheffer polynomials, they're, um, each family of uh, polynomials is related to a distribution, and there's five really famous, or or maybe, well, there, there's five important uh, distributions um, that come along with that. So their probabilities are right there. But also, 
Uh, Bod periodicity relates various flavors of Grassmannians, and Grassmannians, in a certain sense, function like the binomial theorem, which is all about how can you choose. So this idea of what does choice look like, um, uh, that's uh, that becomes uh, defined. Yeah, so this just kind of sharpens, I think, um, the relationship between probability theory and physics, like in what you know, so we'll talk about like statistical mechanics. We'll talk about, you know, why quantum is different than just taking a classical theory and making it into, you know, from mechanics, it's just statistical mechanics. Like what's different about quantum? Um, so um, that'll all come out, not in any elegant format, but, you know, we'll, we'll work it out. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, John Harland, uh, and I were uh, fellow graduate students at the University of California at San Diego. John's uh, PhD was in uh, functional analysis, uh, so which is very helpful if you're into quantum mechanics. Uh, and he teaches math and statistics at uh, Palomar College in California. So the statistics uh, he also is much more uh, familiar with on a daily basis than I am. Uh, yeah, I mean, but it's just the bait, you know, I teach, I teach, uh, lower divisions of stats. So it's just the basic, you know, mm -hmm. basic stuff, you know, um, so we're talking about quantum probability. And we both have uh, degrees in batch bachelor degrees in physics also. So, but John has incredible passion for physics. So that's what we're, that's what we're, uh, here for. And yeah, so we're trying to boost our knowledge, you know, our knowledge structure of physics. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. So let's think about describing systems in classical mechanics. In, in this case, here's a single particle. So a particle is an idealized concept in physics. And um, in fact, it, it, I don't know if we really need to talk about a single particle, but um, we could talk about multiple particles, but let just for simplicity, let's make it a single particle. So um, configuration space, that is the parameters you need to describe that particle at any given time is, I'm just going to write it as C, this kind of script C, mm -hmm. which is equal to the set of all xp where x and p are three-dimensional vectors mm -hmm. all right so really six real parameters to describe a particle at any given time it's xyz co coordinates and its momentum coordinates and so you know here's you know what does configuration space look like here's you know Configuration space. And usually there's more to describing the, the context than just the configuration space itself, but also some modification space called the potential. And the potential, we'll, we'll see how that enters into the time evolution of the physical system in a second, but you know, so basically you start with, you know, a particle in this model starts out at a certain configuration. And I'm just going to write it as C sub zero. And it undergoes some time evolution. And it ends up at a different part of configuration space. A 
certain amount of time later. And in fact, this time evolution puts a flow on configuration space. Any From any initial point, you get to a, a, a final point at time t. And in fact, you can write down the classical time evolution equations. And those are simply that um, the time derivative of P is equal to uh, the negative spatial derivative of V. And the time derivative of X let me see the x or the spatial derivative of x is equal to one over m times p. Sorry, that's the time derivative of x. Mm -hmm. All right. And together, these imply if you take the second time derivative of x known as acceleration, mm -hmm. that's just going to be equal to 1 over m times the spatial derivative of v. So this is force. The spatial derivative of v is force in a conservative mm -hmm. field. And we're assuming a conservative field, just for simplicity here. And v, v is a potential energy. So, right? Right. So from these two time evolution equations, you get Newton's, the familiar um, version of Newton's. That's the third law, law. right? Uh, third law is um, if you push second on something. Second is action, reaction, interaction, reaction? No, I think second is mass equals force times acceleration. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, I mean, <laughs> acceleration Mass time acceleration is equal to force. Um, so let's see. Um, so what are, what are observables? And that's going to be just the set of all functions from configuration space into the real numbers, or they could be into for example, they could be tensors or vectors, so just into some vector space. You know, with sort of like fancy collections of real numbers. Mm -hmm. Um so in particular, our observables in quantum mechanics are going to be complex valued, but it's not you know, it's not really the the main issue. You know, complex mm -hmm. value just means vector valued, you know, complex numbers are just a vector space over C over R2. Mm -hmm. So so it, you know, um, so for example, so F of xp is equal to um, what would this look like um uh one half one over let's see uh, p squared over 2m plus v for example mm -hmm. okay this is actually the energy mm -hmm. And so that's the energy as an observable, you're saying. Energy is an observable. Yes. You talk about um, observables like moment or moment of inertia or uh, 
uh, or not, not, not really that, but um, angular momentum, momentum, position. I see. If you can build it up from position and from momentum, then it's observable. Yes. So, um, so, so is time an observable? Yeah, it's kind I of. I guess you get it from momentum. Is that right? Yeah, it. You know, time. I think it is an observable. It's just that it it's kind of a distinguished observable in a in a certain sense. And it's the same thing in quantum mechanics. There's no time operator. It's a parameter. So. You know, in relativity theory, that parameter time is kind of sort of on equal footing with space, but not quite, you know, because the signature is negative. So it, it's kind of a distinguished spatial variable. Um, and, you know, in the Dac Dirac equation, you know, like the, it kind of plays the same role in a way, but in a way not, you know, it, it really is a distinguished parameter. I don't, Actually, I don't know the right way of thinking about time. And I, I'm not sure physicists do either. It's always like this. They want to treat it on equal footing. But it is not on equal footing, you know. And that's kind of part of my investigations or, you know, kind of trying to unpack. Mm -hmm. I think it's... And, a, and so, so it comes right from the beginning with the configuration space. Like, is time a one of the parts of X or is it not, Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, for constant velocity, um, you can extract time by, you know, forming a ratio of momentum and position. Um, and, but, you know, and then if it's not constant, you can integrate, you know, something that is a function of moment, momentum position to get time. So in a sense, in a sense, um you can treat it like an observable but i'm not sure you can consistently do that in quantum mechanics i i we could try but but maybe my question is uh if you if you were dealing with space time right uh and you had a configuration space would you have it would be eight eight uh dimensions instead of six um well, yeah. So no, no, uh, no. So, so there, you do have X, Y, Z, and T. So your configuration space, you know, is four dimensional. But then, uh, well, and then you have momentum and energy, right? So you momentum have the same energy. Thing. So yes, you do. You do. You have energy momentum tensor. Um, so, so in a sense, it's eight dimensional. Yeah, but momentum and energy are kind of folded in, so you're sneaking in energy there. Um, so I think, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, well, and maybe the point is uh, that uh, they don't have to be independent, right? Or maybe, think maybe that's the question. Like you know, um. Are they independent or not? So like in the classical case, you kind of presume, you know, that, oh, the momentums and the and the positions, they're all independent. You know, everything's possible. But then there, in practice, there could be constraints on your universe, you know, which just says it's finite universe, maybe, well, or it's, uh, you know, it has a shape. They're not so independent. I mean, look at that. I mean, they're, you can it, it, choose an initial position. Um, well, you can, no, I no, mean, I they I are don't. independent in the sense that you can choose a position and you can choose a, you, you can, can choose anything, right, for initial conditions. But you're right, they're not independent uh, in terms of think, what happens next. I think you're, I think choosing independent energy and momentum probably means that you can independently choose mass. Um, that that choice mm -hmm. becomes kind of one of your independent parameters. So it's folded into energy and momentum, I think, in, mm -hmm. in relativity theory, where it's not. You know, mass is like this uh, this fixed Oh, thing. mass becomes this extra thing, right? It becomes this extra thing. Um, so I should also say initial conditions.
which is just specifying a C naught, which is, you know, an X and a P to begin with. So, you know, the idea is that from any initial condition uh, and these time evolution equations, you can figure out, because you can figure out your configuration at any future time C. C. And, and, and maybe just to catch up with you, but just to say that what you're doing here by starting with configuration space, then adding these equations, you're going to like layering the levels of physical reality, you know, that you start with configuration space, then you say, okay, but there are these uh, laws, Newton's laws, let's say, right? And then, okay, and then you can, you know, there's a concept of mass, for example. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, sure it's layering. Um... Well, mathematically, like, you know, you could have a configuration space, but it doesn't, it's not really physical yet in the, it's pre-physics. I mean, well, it's it's one layer of physics. Then you, but physics needs more than that. Physics needs laws mm. of motion. Yeah, that's right. There's kind of yeah. There's a the configuration space layer. Then there's the oh mind of God layer, which is the uh, well. There's a, there's the laws of motion layer, and then there's the potential, right? Like so, you could say, well, yeah. what's the potential, right? Yeah, and it's weird, you know, what what agency do we have over con controlling any of this stuff? Um, mm -hmm. Like, once we, we, we seem to have agency over our initial condition, we can place things uh, to exquisite pre precision wherever we want to begin with. We seem to have agency over, um, over our potential, although I guess you would argue that that's kind of limited to a finite set of 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 basic possibilities um and then the rest we have to let fly the rest we you know just kind of as a con you know like you don't have agency over how these things are going to interact and, and evolve in time you set up well, an and i think that's the kind of curious or cool thing about bot periodicity and the tenfold way of topological insulators is that you get to actually choose some of the rules, uh, the some of the symmetries that will be involved uh, in the, your particular material, let's yeah. say. Yeah, and that would be, you know, if that's the only set, you know, like, you know, up to up to eightfold, you know, this eightfold periodicity, then it really says something very profound about our, our place in the physical universe, you know, and... Um, we, yeah, and that uh, we're like you know, I think you think tweak things a finite uh, into a finite number of initial configurations, you know that, and then the rest you have to let fly, you know. Um, so. Well, in um, to to in talking about these layers, I think the one that we should not ignore is that uh, the configuration space gives you the general possibilities, like what possible. But there's a particular, <laughs> we live in a particular universe with a particular distribution, you know, or a particular configuration within that configuration space, right? So at least at any time, right? So um, uh, that kind of like uh, aspect of the configuration uh, is, uh, you know, some, another godly layer. But in, in, in the case of all these layers, there's a the question, like you're saying, is that, well, on a human scope, you know, let's say controlling what's on the table, so to speak. Uh, what can we control? And then you're going through these and explaining which ones we have more control over, which ones we may not have really. Yeah. You know, we can't make. So. You know. Yeah. Maybe we should proceed. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a great theory. I mean, it predicts orbits of planets. Um, it predicts any number of things about mechanical systems that we build um, and operate, like cars. Um, it, uh, it is, uh, you know, arguably, you know, the, the initial, you know, the original and, and one of the most successful theories in any kind of theoretical investigations ever, you know, that humans have come up with. Um, and it's the template for all dynamical systems. It's a dynamical system in the sense that you choose an initial configuration 
and some evolutionary rules, you know, some time evolution rules, not evolution in the sense of biology, but but um, uh, some dynamical equations. And then for at all points thereafter in time, you're you have complete predictability of where the system is going to be mm -hmm. according to these dynamical rules. So initial condition plus dynamical rules is a dynamical system. So this is the classical dynamical system. And it's very much based on infinitesimals and derivatives and like, you know, con you know, uh, change that's... Uh... And I guess what I'm questioning, like overall is, is there a dynamical system that can underpin physics? Um, and I have a feeling the answer is yes. If you're willing to go to a large enough configuration space and elaborate enough rules, maybe the answer is yes, that dynamical systems are completely general in the sense you can model anything as long as you, you're willing to tolerate a certain Byzantine, you know, level of complication. Almost like the many worlds here, I think of that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's good to keep that in mind that this might, you know, in other words, in principle, maybe everything that changes over time can be modeled this way. Um, so, so for you, I'm just guessing that the many worlds theory is kind of like a solution that uh, tells us or, or suggests to us that a solution exists, right? Like, it right. may not be the solution we want. It may not be the form we want it in, but um, there may be more convenient forms or, or more elegant forms or more like satisfactory forms. But if the fact that there could be one form, right, like is already a, a changing the way we can be looking at this. Yeah. And the thing is, it may not be the best way for us to understand physics or to intuit it. Mm -hmm. but there might be much more powerful ways of intuiting um, physics that lead to lots and lots of measurable consequences, you know, mm -hmm. because we're closer to the reality that we live in rather than some imagined reality, you know. Well, or simply that they're not overblown. Like, you know, you don't have to have all these ghost universes. Let's right, say, or... right. So the fewer ghosts you can talk about, I think the better. But mm -hmm. you, but to to make it a dynamical system, to make, to make that kind of sense of things, it, you know, you might have to go up to a, a system with a lot of ghosts in it, but but it is, I think, philosophically, inter, you know, interesting and 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 uh, important to recognize that, you know, the dynamical systems theory can encompass all that at some level, and maybe the the aim, you know, the game is now not to prove that things aren't a dynamical system, but to try to pare things down enough so that you know, we get we get a more satisfying theory that's more understandable with more predictable mm -hmm. consequences. And um, and knowing all along that we may be just talking about some piece of a larger dynamical system, but that, you know, but but all those details, you know, and all that Byzantine apparatus of the larger system may obscure our thinking from from discovering new things about about physics because it's just too much you know it's too much there's not enough intuition there um so i don't know anyway this is this is classical and beautiful um it's a beautiful theory and there's different ways of expressing it in terms of lagrangian dynamics and hamiltonian dynamics and ultimately unitary dynamics the koopman von neumann stuff that we talked about last time um different different ways of writing down these time evolution equations but it's kind of nice to know that you can write them down in an earthy way just in terms of points moving around in configuration space like in the most basic way and the nice the nice thing about that is that it's just totally intuitive in terms of the way we look at things in the real world we see things moving around and uh yeah this is a six-dimensional space Right, so it's an abstraction of what we actually see with our eyes. Mm -hmm. We only see three dimensions with our eyes, but it's not that much of an abstraction. Um, so it's I like it because it's kind of closer to closer to the part of intuition than the other form 
formalisms. Um, So what's pro what's the problem with this when we get to quantum? So let's let's talk about the double slit experiment and just talk about. Um, so maybe it's good to diagram it. So let's talk about double slit. And certainly this wasn't the first quantum experiment that called into question uh, the veracity of classical dynamics. It was this was after the fact. I think the double slit. This was predicted by de Broglie and then verified, I don't know how many years later, maybe a couple, few years later by experimentalists, but there was other things that were already pushing, mm -hmm. uh, pushing people to doubt the veracity of quantum mechanics. I mean, of, so it's interesting that he suggested um, this and then it was uh, performed. Yeah, it was performed. Yeah. And, um, because, well, I mean, there's the Bohr atom, you know, Stan, and then de Broglie thinking this could be standing waves, you know, so there might be a wave theory and then coming up with a wave theory and then and then it would predict, you know, that you get diffraction. Mm. So, okay, so what is the double slit experiment? The reason why I'm going to this is not because it was the foundational experiment, experiment but it points out all the weirdnesses of quantum mechanics like in one place um and so well at least the foundational weirdness of quantum mechanics so you know what is it you've got a source you do this with just small you know you better do it with small things like electrons um and you're going through two slits. We'll, we'll call them maybe slit S1 and slit S2. And um, and of course, you know, when you fire from the source, a lot of the electrons are going to hit this this back screen here. Mm -hmm. but some of them are going to make it through and um so and then they're going to hit a screen over here so there's some slit, sl slits in the first screen here's the measurement screen and um so there's three things that can happen. So what are the three possibilities? One possibility is you just go through S1. You could also go through S2 And how do you know you've gone through S1? Well, you could block off S1 or you can block off S2. Mm -hmm. We have agency over that, whether we put a block there or not. And, and this would be S1 and S2. Now, it's kind of weird that I say and, but maybe we should just say or to make it clear from a classical point of view. Um, so, you know, in one case, you get one out, you know, what are the results in these three different cases for S1 only, you get, you know, some stuff on the screen that kind of looks like this, you get a concentration. Now this is the, this, this is the, uh, this graph here is the concentration of, mm -hmm. of images on the screen. This is one from S1, from S2, of course, the concentration of images is gonna be farther down the screen. And from S1 and S2, this is the surprise. That you end up getting, you know, this interference pattern. I, I'm only going to 
uh, paint the first, you know, three fringes of it, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is, doesn't look like, this is not, you know, S1 combined with S2. Mm -hmm. And that's the weird thing. Now, you might think, okay, my problem is that I'm thinking of individual particles. But what if we want to look at this statistically? In other words, let's let's not just throw out classical. Let's let's just say that okay, instead of a single particle, I have an ensemble of particles with certain probabilities. And maybe that will solve the problem. In other words, go to a statistical mechanical model rather than a mechanical model. So I think it's worth it going through that just to review what probability theory is and also to compare what you do in statistical mechanics versus quantum mechanics. I think it's really important uh, in terms of unpacking all this stuff. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to do an upgrade. So if you look at things statistically, you know, um, collections of particles, some immersion properties do arise. Like for example, the Maxwell distribution can be looked at that way purely statistically. And it gives very nice um, prediction of the, of the, oh, for example, the, the decrease in air pressure as you go up in the atmosphere. Um, um, so StatMac had already been a thing in the 1800s. It reached sort of its a fine art, you know, in the in the 20th century. Um, but um, so let's try it. So what do you have in StatMec? Um, so this takes into account uncertainty. In other words, incorporates probability theory. And one would hope maybe that if you do it, that you'll, you know, you can somehow combine these probabilistically to get this. So let's just go, let's trace through the logic of that. First of all, what's probability theory? So um, probability theory. There are outcomes. Which are going to be points in C. So any outcome of an experiment is just going to and again, we're talking about stat max, or we're talking about mechanical system. Mechanical systems are described, their configuration space is the C. And so the result of any experiment that we do is just going to be um, a point in C. So uh, we have a probability distribution. We'll call it P. So that, um, and how does this probability distribution work? Um, well, first of all, it, 
when you integrate the DP over the entire um, over the entire configuration space, you get one, which says that the particle's got to be somewhere in configuration space. Um, so this is really from the point of view of you know if you're versed in analysis, it's really a measure. It's a it's a probability measure. It's also a non-negative everywhere, so you don't have negative probabilities anywhere, and it's overall and, mass. And so, and so P is uh, both the position and the momentum for the particle. It's particle P. Well, no, I mean, I'm using P for a, so maybe we should use a different, a different letter here. This is not momentum. Uh, no, it's not the momentum. So, but no, it's for the particle, right? That's why you said particle. P. So, so uh, what's a better, it's, let's call it mu. It's really a measure. Mm -hmm. And so, so what is the, now there's infinitely many points, usually in probability theory in a, in a finite configuration space, you can assign probability to those points. In an infinite configuration space, you can assign, you can only measure probability of mass sets of points. So you have outcome or what are called events or sets, subsets of the configuration space. In reality, you can't just consider all subsets. There's too many of them. You have to limit yourself to a reasonable set of subsets. And usually in the analysis, we make those the Borel sets, basically the sets that come from, uh, you know, taking countable intersections and unions of open sets. Um, open, open balls, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, because every open set is a countable union of open balls. So yeah, you can just start out your basic primitive sets are just open balls. You know, you can do it that way. Um, so, you know, if you get to uncountable stuff, you know, then you get to all kinds of bizarre things that you can't measure. Like, you know, there's, you know, subsets of the real line that you can't make any sense of their mass, you know. Mm -hmm. It's too complicated. So, you know, it, it, events have to be not just any subset if you're talking about an infinite set. Anyway, that's a kind of a technical detail. It was an important technical detail uh, bridging between classical analysis and modern analysis, uh, basically the theory of measures, you know, required like Cantor set theory to really kind of become aware that there were some crazy things that can happen within the sets. Um, so all that was worked out in the early, late 1800s or early, early 20th century. Burrell, uh, people like uh, LeBeg especially, I think, was kind of the pioneer of that. Um, and um, so, and so the probability of an event E is just the integral of this probability measure over E. So if E is the entire set C, it's going to be one. If E is less than the entire set C, it could be less than one. Or it could be zero if E is small enough. So I think it's worth it talking about um, That's uh, just to correct you, maybe it can be less than E and still be one, right? Like you know, if you take yeah. away finite set yeah, of you could take it you could take away some finite number of points in C and still get and still get one. I mean, that's right. right. E, yeah, there's it doesn't have to be the whole thing. Right, it doesn't have to be the whole thing. Or the probability distribution could be spread over a finite area of C to begin with. Right. So those that extra those extra configurations in C don't count because you're talking about maybe a uh, a physical system that starts in one area of position momentum space and evolves to another, but it's going to be in some finite area of position momentum space. It's not going to extend all the way to infinity. Okay. Um, I think it's worth it also talking about um, finite, you know, like uh, finite configuration space. Mm -hmm.
and um, finite configuration space, you know, subs. Now you're talking about the set of all subspaces. Um, well, first of all, it's got, you know, outcomes. It's got a finite set of outcomes, uh, your probability measure, you know, you got a probability of each outcome. You have the sum of these probabilities equaling one. And so it's just, you know, it's just the finite version. It's just much easier to understand. Mm -hmm. So finite number of outcomes and then the set of all subsets of those outcomes is a finite set. So, um, you know, event space, there's two to the N possible events. So, um, and the probability of each event is just the sum over, you know, the probabilities of the individual C's where CI is in the event. Um, so, you know, that these, these integral formulas have, you know, finite analogs that are maybe easier. Mm -hmm. to understand. So, you know, all this integral formalism is just sort of maybe uh, window dressing on the, on the, on finite probability theory, at least for our purposes. Um, okay. Um, here's another formalism. Um, oh, by the way, the events, instead of all events, form a Boolean algebra. With uh, with union and intersection, and this is the classical statistical yeah. mechanics. Yes, this just cl classical stuff. So we have E one union E two, and E one intersect E two are also events. So you could take two events and throw. Uh, throw all their outcomes into a single set. That's a new set called E1, E, unit E2, or you could just take the common outcomes in this. And this could be infinite sets or finite sets. And, you know, one thing that Boolean algebra is you get, um, one thing you get is De Morgan's Law. And so um, here we're talking about a potent, like maybe a single particle, right? Um, or it could be two particles moving around, in which case you're in, you know, you're okay. In, and then it's like you double the number of dimensions. Yeah, yeah you can double you can double your dimensions in general in in um, in statistical. Okay, so it can be more complicated. But what does it mean to have a, uh, you know, a subset of these, uh, or basically like a set of these uh, configurations? What is that? Uh, in what sense is that thought of as an event? Well, basic outcomes, um, if you want to think of those as configurations, an, an event is just um, the set of all. So, um, you know, I think we're, we'll I'll, I'll do some Venn diagrams in a bit. Um, but basically, you're just talking about some blob of, you know, an event could be some, you know, um, some blob in here of possible configurations. And it's just some subset of configuration space so it's okay it's so i can i can imagine that it's a i guess so that i can imagine that the, you know it's a possibilities for where the particle is it's a possibilities right. of where the system uh, actually is right right but then i don't know why is that called an event uh because if you do a measurement and 
you know, it happens to be in that subset, then you say the event has happened. And okay, if, so if what it is, it's um, of... so if I can translate it into my mental vocabulary, it's delineating, it's constricting, it's a constriction of where it could be, right? I mean, you say I measured it within this degree of uh. Yeah, error, let's say it's a coarse graining. Yeah, instead of looking at individual outcomes and saying, "Oh well, my the outcome, my experiment has got to be a particular point in space," I it can be say in the left half configuration space or the right half configuration. Right. Okay. Uh, one E one, the other E two. So my and if, in fact, it's very clear uh, from any experimental apparatus that you're only going to be able to narrow things down not to uh, individual outcomes but events because there's going to be some minimum radius uh, that you, you'll you be able to, you know, precision right. to, able to distinguish. Okay, yeah. so it's some kind of zone where the, the measurement's yeah. restricting to. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so, you know, the question is, if you think of things in this more kind of general way, oh, it's not particular points, we're actually talking about like collections of points, maybe, maybe we can get this kind of, behavior out of it and we'll talk about that in just a moment and then then also like if you did repeated experiments um that's a little bit of a tricky like how you think of that because basically it's like a new particle running through the machine you know it's like you're you're adding just more particles right and one reason i say that is because uh you can't get multiplicity in this configuration space you know you can't say oh this is this particle has returned or this particle came you know has, has been here three times right like that doesn't exist uh those concepts yeah so i mean the thing about stat mac is you could talk about um like ensembles which are you know basically looking at a single system but just a whole uh statistical like it's almost like restarting the experiment like a bunch of times right you can talk about, no, you can talk about it's that's equivalent to non-interacting particles ha happening all at once mm -hmm. multiple non-interacting particles and that's not equivalent to multiple interacting particles which includes like forces between those particles so i mean all that mm -hmm. is fair game in step mech let me um pause the recording for a moment zoom record there we go okay So De Morgan's laws, you know, one thing that comes out of De Morgan's laws, I mean, one, one thing that comes out of having a Boolean algebra um, is you get De Morgan's laws, which are you know, one way of saying them is that A, E1, let's see, form of De Morgan's laws that I wanted to do here. E1 union E2 intersect E3. is the same set as E1 intersect E3 union E2 intersect E3. There's many consequences of Boolean algebra, but you know, this is one mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. So it's not just any old, you know, I mean, this is very specific, the way these operations work. And you can think of these as algebraic operations on a set. <clears throat> And this is one of the consequences of, uh, in fact, is De Morgan's law a, I think for Boolean algebra, it might be an axiom. I'm not sure you mm -hmm. could. Yeah, it might be one of the axioms of Boolean algebra. But in the case of set theory, it comes uh, from a more basic place. You can prove it as a consequence of set theory. Um, okay. So sets form a Boolean algebra with union and intersection as the two operations. Okay, what are some other things? Oh, uh, let's just kind of get all the all the different ways of thinking about um, probability theory under our belts. Okay, so indicator functions. There's an alternative algebra, and this is going to help us, like guide us through quantum 
probability. Mm -hmm. um, and this is indicator functions. Indicator functions are um, x e is a function from configuration space into the real numbers, and it's actually it's into the real numbers, um, but it's actually into the set zero and one. Basically, mm -hmm. um, x e of or chi. I guess this is is this a chi. Chi, yeah, so, yeah. chi of x is equal to one if x is an e, and it's zero if x is not an e. Mm -hmm. So each outcome is either in the set e or not in the set e, and um, so it lights up to value one if x is in e and gives you value zero if x is not in e. Um, so uh, the indicator function um, of say e1 in union e2 of x is that's another indicator function. And all you do is you take the two indicator functions and you add them together. Mm -hmm. uh, but you better, if any there's any overlap between these two sets, you counted uh, the indicators, each of the individual indicator functions, we'll put a one there, so you get a two. So to make it back into an indicator function, you have to subtract. Mm -hmm. The overlap. It's like inclusion exclusion yeah. in combinatorics. You you overcount okay. it and then you subtract. So, so the set of indicator functions is a Boolean algebra. Hmm. Just one to one with uh, sets. Yeah, with with um, let's see the what subset. Is, what let's see Boolean algebra union corresponds to addition, and and intersection corresponds to multiplication. So that turns it into uh, algebraic. It's sort of like an like do you want to think of addition being your algebraic operation, multiplication being your operation. The disjoint union is uh, addition, right? By what you said above. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Disjoint no, union. No, it's just... I'm just, sorry. I, I have to... I'm just I have being nitpicky, but been, yeah. No, no, no. It's very, very... I guess it'll be relevant for the quantum mechanics, but... Uh, yeah, we better, we, we better use this... Um, and actually, I, since I'm going to use circle, so we have to define what we mean by addition. I'm going to put a box around it, disjoint union. So it's an algebraic operation. Um, I'm just defining this right here. Mm -hmm. So it's an algebraic operation of what looks like addition, but of course you, it's this more elaborate addition where you have to subtract out the overlap. If if mm -hmm. even two are disjoint, then it's just addition. If they're not, you have to subtract the overlap, and that's why it's not pure addition. The operation is not pure addition. It's like this. It's like this compensated addition. But you know what's cool is that you know pure multiplication of these indicator functions gives you exactly intersection. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it's nice to be flexible in the way you can think about, about um, sets. So, you know, outcomes are indicator functions, or I, I'm sorry, events are indicator functions. And, um, you know, the probability
with this Boolean algebra, we just look at indicator functions as being the outcomes. And what's the probability of an indicator function? Oh, I see. It's just equal to, well, it's the probability that's set, but you can think of it as the, um, just the integral of that indicator okay. function. So the indicator function lights up when you're on E and goes dark when you're off E. So you're basically going to get just the probability of E. You're, yeah, you're getting the, getting the size the, of E. The size yeah. of E is the probability. It's a nice alternative way of thinking about mm -hmm. the Boolean algebra. Um, and it's going to help us bridge into quantum. Um, into what we call quantum probability theory. It's going to be a nice analogy. Um, let's see. Um, what are some other things? Um, with these indicator functions, you can talk about a resolution of the identity. It's another way of talking about um, probability distributions. That is, this is a set of indicator functions. And now I'm just going to talk about finite because, um, well, I think that'll be sufficient for our purposes. So mm -hmm. resolution of the identity is a bunch of indicator functions um, such that, you know, the pairwise product of them is zero. Mm -hmm. Which means they're disjoint, right? The disjoint sets, the underlying sets are disjoint. Again, there's always a set theory interpretation. It's just like an algebraic layer over that set. It's just mm -hmm. a more algebraic way of thinking about the set theory stuff. And that the sum of these probabilities and I really don't I really should not call this okay. Let's call it expected value, uh, which is really okay. the probability of that set. We shouldn't, you know, we should have a different language for it. So I'm sorry. And this is so, but it's calculating the probability, right? It's calculating for... the probability of these sets, and that I'm sorry. No, 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 no. We don't even have to talk about that. That's that's a layer that that we don't need. All we need is that the sum is equal to one. That's the identity. Well, they're disjoint and their probabilities are adding up to 100%. That's so. right. So we get the identity function. So it's a way, it's what's called a resolution of the identity. It's, a, it's equivalent to specifying a probability distribution. You know, the probability of E, uh, you know, the way the probability distribution mm -hmm. comes is the probability of EI. And so there could be a continuous analog with integration. And that's right. Yeah, but I don't I don't think it but we don't have to do that. I don't no. think we have to do that. I just want to talk about this because we're going to talk about it in, in the quantum context. And I can see that, that the progress we're making here is is glacial. So we're gonna to have to but continue. but, you know, but I hope you can at least maybe give some of the quantum uh, interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Maybe try to switch over now. Yeah, so let's talk about whether this um, setup, it's, you know, it's sort of like classical mechanics with a probability layer. Does this mm -hmm. solve the this double slit conundrum here? Does it, you know, is it possible that 
that we can get this kind of behavior out of a statistical version of classical mechanics. In other words, statistical mechanics. Mm -hmm. So and the answer is no, right? Like the answer is no, so. and the answer is no, and so. But again, let me—I'm not quite there yet. Let's talk about random variables. Random variables really correspond to measurables. That is, quantities of interest associated with the with the dynamical system, with the physical system. Could be energy, momentum, whatever. Um, what are these? These are functions of state. Uh, by the way, you know, with this resolution of the identity, um, you may not be, often you're not interested in any finer coarse graining than these sets here. In other words, you're taking blocks of mm -hmm. configuration space and you're saying that, okay, in those blocks of configuration space, those are kind of, I'm going to kind of consider that coarse graining my, my, my basic outcomes. Now, in classical mechanics, you can always boil it down to points in configuration space. And so maybe your resolution of the identity goes all the way down to that level. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it need not. You could talk about just sections of configuration space that you're interested mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. and for example, the sections of configuration space that would end up with a, with a, a die landing on one, mm -hmm. you know. So the die landing on one would be the whole bunch of configurations in configuration space, uh, initial configurations that would land that would that would get you a one, and then die landing on two, and so forth. So you're breaking up this. In the case of a of, of a die, a six sided die, you're breaking up configuration space into six different events, and you're only interested in those events. Well, think about what those events look like in con con configuration space. They're very complicatedly interleaved, right? The, mm -hmm. the difference between landing on a one and landing on a two, or landing on a one and landing on a six, maybe just tiny little differences. So you can just imagine this impossible, impossibly complex uh, division of configuration space into six subsets that are all sort of entangled with one another, just interleaving. Mm -hmm. You know, just braided all over the place um and so uh but that's still statistical mechanics it's not quantum yet so talk about random variables now random variable is just a, a function from configuration space into real numbers or or it could be into a vector space over the real numbers um and uh, what else here? So, you know, with a resolution of the identity, in a more coarse graining way, you can define a random variable as just being, you take these indicator functions. And you just put numbers in front of these indicator functions and sum them up. And so you may not be interested in any other random variables. I mean, it, this is just sums of indicator functions that are that are going to be constant on each subset. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like a step function. So maybe you're only interested in these step function random variables. And more generally, you might be interested in much finer random variables or much finer resolutions of the mm -hmm. identity. Um, but the thing is, is that these functions do, in some sense, approximate all the other functions. You know, these set of indicator functions are dense in say L2 of the configuration space. So in a sense, you're so, not- So these, these step functions are basically just saying like, what will matter to us is the resolution, the breakdown of the 
configuration space yeah. into the particular subsets, and then we'll be constant on those subsets, just like you would be constant on a single point, let's say, yeah. right? And so these are like crude points, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, they are, they are. And you think, okay, well, you know, if I'm talking about it, some area configuration space like this, I mean, certainly I can't just say the energy is constant over this enter this area of configuration mm -hmm. space unless i choose a unless i choose a level set for energy and then in which case i'm all right so maybe my maybe my um crude breakdown of configuration space or level sets of energy or maybe mm -hmm. they're small enough so the energy i could talk about the average energy at the middle of that little ball mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um Anyway, it's just different ways of coarse graining, different ways of breaking down a configuration space into smaller parts or 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 modeling very complicated functions with simpler functions. Um, and so what is the expected value? You know, is it okay to use EXP? Because uh, that usually says exponential. That's kind of... I don't know. I'm I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't um, mind. I think the expected value is all right. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I'm using ease, and so you know, if I'd been more careful with my 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 vocabulary here, I would have used e just for expected value. But let's call it exp of a random variable. So the continuous case. is just um well what is it you just take the function and integrate it you just average it over the probability distribution so discrete if you're going to use the simpler discrete And um, discrete, you would just take the expected value. It's going to be the sum of lambda i. So in the discrete case, that's where f of x is equal to just a finite sum of indicator functions, or it could be infinite sum of in indicator functions. So just more explicitly, it looks like this. Uh, it's going to be... Um, So you're just taking the probability of the basic event EI that you're building up this indicator, this, this step function with, and you're um, multiplying it by the weight for that indicator function. So in other words, EXP is a linear function. Mm. Is a linear functional that goes from configuration space into the real numbers or yeah from configuration space into the real numbers or if you just want to coarse grain configuration space it's a linear functional on this set of step functions okay so um this relates to probability distributions right like um this is a, so like a, you have a measure mu, right? Yeah. Do you have a measure mu? Then f of x is your random variable you're saying, right? Like, yeah. and so it's taking different values uh, within the configuration space. And so then you have this measure. And so then it will tell you how it'll add up to an expected value. Yeah. We're, or or like in the case. discrete case, uh, your measure, well, you have this probability function you're saying, right? You break up E sub I, your space into E sub I's, uh, you have, they add up to 100% uh, when you look at the probabilities on them. And then you're going to, um, the expected value will be, well, in each region, you have a different constant. And so uh, what's the, 
weighted average of those constants. That's the expected value. Yeah. That's what you're seeing, right? Okay. And this, it basically, I mean, you can use this to derive that, or you can, you know, I mean, another, another way of seeing it. I, right, they're, they're related. So they're, what, in they're what really, sense is it linear? I guess that's the question. Uh, well, uh, let's just, let's just, let's just do this computation here. The expected value of F is equal to the expected value of, you know, lambda I uh, times the indicator function. And now we're just going to distribute uh, the expected value, and we're going to pull out constants. Well, the lambda i are constants uh, for each i, so you pull those out in front, and you get the expected value of the indicator function. Which is the probability, right? That's right. So okay. That's So I probably should have done that. Um, in effect, this really is, you know, this is the integral of um, well, it's a little hard to, yeah, no. I, I, you could call it lambda, right? You could call I mean, it lambda. Yeah, I, you know, we're I mean, it's like it, the integral it, of it lambda is, of it, x over you know, d. I mean, this whole thing can be written as you know the integral of this indicator function. Mm -hmm. I mean, the set function. Okay. But, but then you know that's what this thing is right here. So it really- And you're integrating over all of E, right? That, or you're, no, you're, or you're all of C, all I guess, C, basically. But, but these indicator functions are constant. You pull the con, you, you can pull the sum out and the, and the right. uh, constants out, and then the indicator functions are constant over each subset. Mm -hmm. You know, they're equal to one. So they, they just pull out the size of that subset. Uh, when you and there's finitely many, right, so. So maybe I should write that down. No. That's all. No, that's all clear. It's it's all in the equation. I think it's. So note that I I think I had this that when you inter integrate an inter indicator function, that's just equal to, you know, the measure of e, which is the probability of e. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's all basic stuff. So okay. So you know, um, this is. Uh, the way things are set up in probability theory and and um, and then you know the question is you know does this help us at all for understanding this double slit uh, paradox and or conundrum and and the answer is no because let's take a look at configuration space again you know you know the idea so this is configuration space mm -hmm. with a certain potential and we're going to let s1 i'll just write it out here ba basically if you go through slit one there's a set here that you can identify as S1. Mm -hmm. In other words, a set of all configurations, initial configurations that result in you going through slit one. The set of all configurations that result in you going through slit two, and these are disjoint because you either go through slit one or slit two, mm -hmm. right? In, in, in classical theory. How do I know I go through either slit one or slit two? Because every classical particle has a a one dimensional path through configuration space. One real, you know, in terms of a in terms of a manifold, it's a one dimensional manifold, and that's only going to allow you to be, you know, if you're going to go through points. In configuration space, um, 
there's only one point, you know, one set of points offered by slit one and one set of points offered by slit two, another set of points offered by slit two, you can't go through both. I mean, I mean, this, these set of uh, that's not entirely here. clear. Uh, they can't go through both because it could go through them multiple times, you know, back and forth and back and forth. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, that's right, that's right. It could be ricocheting off the the screen and going back and forth, and yeah, that's all been analyzed. Um, so I mean, this would include all that. I mean, it would be. Um, I'm just saying, like, there's, you know, it's well, kind of obvious. It's going, you know, it doesn't happen like that. But but the point being that. Uh, you know, the argument not, would have to be more, I don't know. No, I think I think that those arguments were considered. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, you know, there is some complication there. But basically, you can shine a light on this thing, or you can do intermediate um, observations on this particle. And, and, you know, at this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, resulting in it, it, and it slamming into the screen, the measurement screen. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you know, you're either going through here or you're going through here. In other words, we're going to divide up the configuration space into those where we observe something going through S1 or we observe it going through S2. Now, you might ask yourself, are there situations where it goes back and forth through S1? Well, I think that's not, that's not really the issue. No, but I think it is. I think I mean, the, 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 main issue, the main issue is, can it be at two places at once? The answer is well, no. The, the answer right, is like, no because that's completely incompatible with the theory. And then the other the other question is, could it be going back and forth in some subtle way? I mean, after all, these are tiny little things that mm -hmm. in a way that you know it's like it's like slamming back and forth multiple times before it you know ricocheting back and forth multiple times before it actually arrives at the measurement screen. Mm -hmm. So. So the thing is, you would have to measure that. You'd have to measure these oscillations and and realize that um, you you're you know maybe you can't isolate it from going from just slit one and slit two, but in practice, any kind of measurement that you set up in a classical sense where you can measure these things as classical particles, you can observe it either going through S one or S two. Now that does not to say that maybe in some more elaborate setup you know, that that doesn't happen. But I think that that was analyzed early on. Well, uh, I think, I, think, I mean, I don't think that, I, I think all kinds of absurd things can happen. I think the argument, you know, in this context is that you do not have a part in classical, the world, you do not have one thing in two different places at one time. That's just a general principle. Yeah, but it, and, could, it, could, be going, it could be going really, really fast. Right through. Well, both. I think the other point is that uh, so it can't be at the same place at the same time. So then there are two different general paths. So like there's different paths that it could go on, but those paths are kind of like forming a stream, let's say. And those two streams are segregated, right? Like They're there's right. a stream that's passing through one slit. There's a stream. Those are segregated. So now all kinds of, you know, crazy things may be happening on the margin, but basically like, you know, there's one stream, there's another stream. Those streams are sufficiently segregated. There are two separate slits. Yeah. And so that's the conundrum. And then you are also, uh, you know, to segregate those streams, you are probably relying on the Newton's laws of physics explaining, you know, that uh, basically it's going to move in a straight line, you know? So, yeah. so, you know, to the first order, it's clear like that, um, what we know intuitively in real life, right? Yeah, and I think that you can you can experimentally kind of rule out things. You can you can you can mm -hmm. control. You have some control over the energy of these particles uh, at the source. Of course, it's going to be a distribution of energies, but you can put this screen back far enough so that at least you can rule out ricochets off that screen in the mm -hmm. time frame that you would expect. You know, particles to be going be traveling and um so that you could rule out like ricochets back and forth between the slit screen and the measurement screen um then that doesn't say that 
you know, things could be, you know, weirdly changing their direction, like here, you know, just kind of going back and forth because the sun, un, you know, unaccounted for forces. Well, that's why you have to rely on Newton's laws, right? Like, you know, I think you do. You, you have to say, okay, what potentials would cause that? And there's no plausible potential that this particle is seeing. Now, we don't understand the subatomic world entirely. And so it could be that there's potentials in the vicinity of those screens that we don't understand that are turning it back. But then the question, the question is like, how fast would it have to travel between those screens? And is it possible mm -hmm. for the slit screen to impart those kinds of energies that would allow it to go this way? Well, and I think, I think, yeah, there's that there's first order effects and then there's subsequent order effects, right? So how could, you know, if, if you're, <laughs> Lots of things could happen on the third order, or fourth order, or fifth order effect, but why would they be important? You know, like like right. in this experiment, I think that's the main especially, argument, right? Like, especially if this thing is firing through some high velocity, and I think it usually is. Like, you would it would take an incredible force to divert it and to come back through the other one. It would, and then you could probably rule that out as it could not be a first order effect. There's no way that 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 you know that kind of thing could be happening. Um, but it does, you know, I mean, it does call into quite, it does say that maybe there is a complicated theory, right? If it's Byzantine enough, you could probably explain it, but we're going to find out there's a much simpler explanation using quantum reasoning the where you don't have to rely on any of that stuff. And so the simplicity of the quantum model, I think is, is going to be, um, evident even though it doesn't rule out some other classical thing that might be happening now. Um, anyway, so, it, I mean, it, in David, in David Bowen, So can you say anything more about the quantum or not today? No, well, I, I think we ought to finish off our discussion here before we head off to quantum, but I think we have to understand, you know, what the, what the beef is, even with, with a reasonable statistical theory is that, okay. in in, in non-statistical theory, you would have a point and a point, you know, that would result in going through slit one and slit two. But in, in statistical theory, you could have a whole blob that goes through, you know, a whole set of, of configurations that initial configurations that goes through slit one. And then, of course, there's some time evolution that happens. So the time evolution you know might change the nature of these slits i mean of these blobs it might turn this one into another blob but it turns out it's going to have the same volume um, by leoville's theorem so this is st and quite frankly i'm not uh you know, I just was underprepared here. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, so these two blobs um, evolve. But the thing is, if you go through S1 or S2, and those are the original configurations, then things are going to be non overlapping here also. Because classical mechanics is one to one; it's a invertible flow. So there won't be any overlap here after a certain amount of time if there was no overlap here. And so, when... is that is that? But how does that jive with the diagrams? Right, like you know, because the diagrams overlap. Uh. Well. What S1 and S2 means is you go through slit one or slit two. It's true that you could end up in the same place, right? You could, you could, but so how does that, uh, but how does that look at ST and S, S, S? So let's, let's, let's take a look at it. You're right. Okay. If you go through S1, you're going to get a, a blob here. If you go through S2, you're going to get a blob here. And, you know, so there may be some overlap. In other mm -hmm. words, they may end up in the same part of the screen, for sure. But 
the problem is if you open up both slits and that's what we're talking about we're opening both slits and we're just tracking whether you go through s1 or s2 you're not going to end up with the interference pattern you're going to end up with two blobs that look like that now of course right they, right but that's not what you were saying you were saying that they were disjoint i was saying if they go i wasn't talking about the final outcome on the screen i wasn't talking about you know we should set up a y parameter for the screen Okay, so that your your T is different, uh, but well, it's just not clear what your T means. I think that's the issue. Well, T means T means um, yeah, that's right. It, right before you hit the screen, I think. Uh, well, then they start to overlap, right? Right. Uh, no, no. You see, um, this is the points in configuration space where we're not talking about the. Okay, so we have to talk about the confined con the the. Okay, so there's an event of hitting the screen, maybe with a with some kind of error here. So what hitting the screen, what I'm saying is that this blob here comes from two things. It comes from going through slit one. And hitting the screen at Y. This blob here comes from two events going through S. So basically, we're talking about a configuration space. Right. The original configuration space, the new configuration space, or the sample space, or the outcome space is really two things. It's whatever the, you have in configuration space with a particle flying through what are potentials it's encountering, including the the potentials given by the slits. And then the this configuration right before you hit the screen. Together with the the config together with the position that you hit the screen at. So I'm looking at configuration space, and these are both configuration space. This one is configuration space, this is configuration space. It's just that I wanted to kind of come clean about the fact that you could start with an initial configuration where you're gonna go through slit one. It may look quite a bit different in configuration space right before you hit the screen, but if you start out disjoint here, you're gonna end up disjoint here. Well, I think there's, I mean, I think there's several issues here. One is like, one is like the reversibility of classical physics, right? Mm -hmm. To say that uh, if you see, and then I think the deal there too is like, the screen is not measuring, the screen is measuring position. The screen is not measuring momentum, right? So yeah, if so you, we're, we're, you we're, know, so first of all, like we're, you know, typically in the double split, experiment you're ignoring the final momentum was it coming from above was it coming from below right like so if you knew it was coming from below then you know that it was coming from s2 right if you knew that it was coming from above then you know it was coming from s1 i think so that's the first things that were configuration space is momentum and position but in the diagram we're only showing position right that's the first issue no, we're if you were doing that. both if you're doing both momentum and position, then in that sense, it should be reversible. Like you, in that sense, you can't get to the same position with the same momentum in two different ways. That's not possible because you could go backwards, you know, so it's got to be two different paths. Now, though, in the experiment, it's all about position. You can get to the same position in two different ways, right? Okay. Like if you're only really interested in position. Uh, and so the 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 point about why is this classical not going to be solved is simply about uh, the fact that you can't get destructive interference with classical addition. You know, like that's the issue. Right. And, and that's what I was about to write down here. Yeah. That you can't you know, go through slit one. And go through slit two and end up at the same place. I'm sorry. 
and then say, okay, we're going to do one or the other. You're going to go through slit one or slit two, but still end up at EY. In classical, again, this is the same thing as going through slit one and going through slit two or going through slit two and ending up at EY. So this would be from a classical point of view. And mm -hmm. again, this is a statistical classical point of view. We've taken into account that we could have a whole blob of configurations here, a whole blob of configurations here, and we're going to still end up with this thing being true. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we observe. This does not give the interference pattern. Right. It gives this, not the interference pattern. Right. And so this idea that you could somehow you have a straightforward statistical mechanical theory that that you know predicted the interference pattern is still not going to happen you know and and uh yeah for some reason it took an hour to say that um so we need something different and the basic idea is is that we need like a different view of what sample space and all this stuff is. Um, and so there's a couple points of inspiration here. So what are the So the inspiration for this different model, there's one inspiration is that the, you know, S1 and S2 appear to be combining as waves. not as collections of classical configurations. And the inspiration too, is that when you measure something in a certain state, so if there's some kind of a process M um, results in measurement in uh, in a state or collection of states then if you don't disturb the system, you just leave it alone. And you go to measure it again, it's still gonna be in that state or that collection of states. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And I think it's a really important observation. I think it was a key observation. Um, that when you say measure spin up particle, you subject it to a spin up apparatus, you can let it keep going, keep flying along. And then if you measure it on the same axis, it's 100% certain that it will still be spin up. If you measure an electron, it's hit a screen, you go back to look at it again, it's still there. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, if you isolate a particle into some area of a of a an apparatus, some area of a box, and and you know you put a you put a wall there, it's still going to be in that area of the box. Um, if it's a high enough potential barrier. In other words, if you you know, in other words, if you if you um, say image an, an atom trapped in an ion trap and you keep it in that ion trap and you you shine light on it and it it fluoresces or whatever it it, it uh, you know absorbs light and re-emits it so that you see a flash and you go back later and do the same experiment again it will still be in that ion trap as long as you didn't change the 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 setting around that atom in other words you didn't release it from the trap so so the idea that quantum mechanics is inherently probabilistic is kind of flawed it's not you know it's not that you but, can't have predictability so then that'll be interesting how you talk about things like quantum tunneling you know or well quantum tunneling is just because I mean that that's easy to see because if you have a finite potential barrier and you look at the stationary wave functions, you know, you look at the eigenfunctions, they have <clears throat> they have some non-zero amplitude outside, you know, on both sides of the barrier. Mm-hmm. But and, if you measured it inside the barrier, right? Uh if you measured it inside the barrier, but you know, then you've got to trap it. Right, you've got to raise those potential bars. Um, so, yeah, you measure it inside the barrier. When I guess what I'm saying is that if that barrier was high enough, you'd have a very large probability of seeing it in the next in the next. Yeah, frame. but you won't have hundred percent. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So ion traps aren't hundred percent, but they can be pretty good. Especially with you, but that's not so. That but that's not what you were talking about. You're saying that there is no probability. Like, if you Uh measured it, it'll be there. Yeah. So that's 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 not contradicting what I just said. So you measured in a state that had some tail. You know, in other words, you measured it. You know, in a certain place in some ion trap or some. uh, So uh, some potential. Well, like let's say it's an it's within an atom, right? And then maybe it tunneled out, you know, of that atom. So, yes, but you see, that's taken into account in the state. You didn't actually measure it in a, you know, when you measured it, it's not like a state was, was. Well, you see, like, so I think the question is like, then to explain how quantum tunneling works, right? Because, because that doesn't, doesn't, uh, it doesn't, if you measure something, yeah. Then that would suggest that at that point, quantum tunneling is not possible anymore so because it's, it's can, been determined. I can see how you can interpret what I said as a contradiction of that, but it's really not. Um, what I mean, what I mean by um, a state or collection of states is that um, that if those states are confined to a certain area of space, if that's a if that is a uh, property of the those states or collection of states, and they have zero amplitude of being outside that, then yes, you will still see them in that state. In other words, with a hundred percent probability within that within that trap. Um, but if being in the trap, if it's not a complete trap, in other words, like a like a finite barrier, um, 
then being in that state means that there's always some potential, there's always some probability of it, you know, some amplitude of it being outside the 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 radius given by that potential barrier. Um, then going to measure it again doesn't preclude, you know, and being in the same state doesn't preclude that the position is going to be outside that potential barrier. It could still be in the same state. Mm -hmm. It just happened to have an, you know, it happened to interact with your apparatus outside of that. So being in the state doesn't, so if being in a state means you are absolutely confined, like you got a very, very high wall, then next time you go to measure it, you're going to, with nearly 100% probability, going to see it. Um, and, you know, well, I'm just thinking mathematically, like, you know, to be in a state means that uh, uh, there's a certain uh, curve that you're on, but that curve extends off to infinity. So it may not if, the, if that, well, I mean, or it may not, but but it may, right? Like, I mean, you know, right? So I mean, it could be that so you know, probability it's, finding it's, it outside. And that, that's a basically that's a probability curve, right? Like, you know, yeah. So, so, you know, what I kind of misspoke when I said if you find it in a certain position that you're always going to find it in that position or in that range of position, if you have. I mean, if it's a mathematical fact about eigenstates and eigenfunctions, right? Like you have a finite barrier, yeah, finite potential barrier. So there's always some possibility it's going to be, you know, the next time you measure it, it'll still be in the same state, but. But on the other side of the barrier. The <laughs> Is that that's but, how? I, so it's a little it's a little confusing. I can see how a learner of quantum mechanics would struggle with that and say, wait a minute. Well, it's not a struggle, it's just a matter of what are we talking about? <laughs> like yeah. you know, the, the quantum barrier is not the issue. The I mean, so basically it can be in the same state, but be on the, you know, be um I think also like what does it mean to be measuring something, right? Like what are we talking about, right? Like so um what are we measuring specifically? But, yeah, so um, so it's kind of, I mean, maybe to say like position, I don't know, like the, the, the position you record and then the wave function, you know, for a particular mode of position, you know, is two different things, right? And yeah. so, yeah. And you're talking about the wave oh, function, you're, you're right? Like you're some, not talking about well, the actual. Some, you're measuring some aspect of the wave function, some, some, you know, some random variable that is being averaged over that wave function, right? So, you know, there is a distinction between, you know, the measurements that you're doing in a experiment and the underlying state of the system, the under, underlying wave function. And so it can e you can easily conflate those two things, but they they mean different things. So, I mean, the axiom like we don't really ever have access to the actual state, right? We have access to measurements, and measurements are based on random variables, you know, me you know, measurables. And so, yes, I mean, there might be a spread of the the possibilities of those measurables, um, but as long as your measurement did not kick the the system out of that state and there's nothing else subsequently that is going to perturb that state it's still going to be in the same state when you go back to measure it now that means the random variable of or the measurable mm -hmm. position might be different but it's still going to be dictated by that state the, mm -hmm. in other words measurables have a whole range of possibilities as we'll see. Well, so maybe maybe just to say, like, so when we well, meet again, like, like like this is this will be clarified. You know, like yeah. this is an inspiration, like you say, and this is kind of like an like a, mm -hmm. yeah. this is an important this is an important thing. But the words the words are not expressing the 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 fact. You know, this is just an inspiration uh, to figure out what does that mean, right? Like, well, I, I mean, you say it's a matter of what you're talking about and defining it, but the thing is. Um, well, like a measurement, like, like you're saying, like a measurement may very well just take a system out of uh, its state, right? So, well, yeah, pardon? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, how do you tell if it did or didn't? Right? Like, you know, um, it's not clear from the sentence. 
No, it's not. And I think sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. So, but so when if you don't know something that basic, like then the sentence becomes basically meaningless, you know, like. Well, it's not though. It's not. It is. It's an axiom, right? And the thing is, what do I mean by state? Well, meaningless as a yeah, it becomes a theoretical axiom, right? Like, but meaningless from a practical point of view, right? Like, you know, then the theory, if it's developed, it could become practical, but right. of its own, right? Like, it's just an idea. It's not really. So maybe this uh, stating this as an inspiration might be not kind of a, a. It's an inspiration. I think that's the correct word. You know, to say like, there's going to be, you know, and I've been you know, taught this, right? And and you've told me this many times. It's just the question, what's the context? You know, what is this talking about, right? That's yeah. insufficient. I think that's, it's insufficiently expressed. Well, and also we don't have a, you know, like uh, I feel that the whole foundation thing, you know, we talk about states and that kind of stuff. And that is a, that is a fraught concept um, in, in and mm -hmm. of itself. We don't really know what these states mean. Like, you know, Heisenberg, like Schrodinger originally thought, oh, these right. are these are these are waves. And then he later, you know, when he thought about helium as two interacting quantum particles, I mean, how could that be a wave in space? It's in it's in six dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, six spatial dimensions. That's not a wave. And yet you have to write it that way as a wave in a high dimensional space. Well, in this case, 12 dimensions with well, well, six dimensions with spatial dimensions. Um, and that's not a wave. You know, that's, a, that's not a wave in three dimensions. There's no one is a wave in three uh, dimensions. You know, so I'm with you. You're uh, my uh, you're my inspiration. <laughs> but yeah. uh, and you're what you're doing is you're saying that in all of this uh, morass of quantum theory, but like these are two points that you think will be key. But just because you think they're key and, you know, and just because I, you know, I'm a fan of your thinking, but that doesn't, that doesn't really say that much at this point. No, you I, will show that in the subsequent, like where, you know, you'll develop that. That's, I think we're on. That's right. That's right. But these are the two things that I trace back. Yeah. To be the inspiration for what we're going to call quantum probability theory or something. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and, um, so yeah, I'm sorry. You know, like I don't have this worked out. You know, you can tell. No, that. I think with the, with the, just just to put it in context, and I'll I'll uh, explain in the introduction. You know, and I'll wait until we have a part two. I don't uh, think but I, just say yeah. that this was the this was the grounding. Like, why do we need quantum probability theory? Right. This is yeah. where we start from with the classical. So then the exciting part will come next time. But, you know, so I, I thank you I'd for. Almost, I'd almost mm -hmm. I'd almost prefer to to you know like hash this out or or for me to like have time to hash this out as an actual lecture and then to go over it again you know like you say this is not really i mean someone this is like way too much banter it's way too uh well way um, too rough. Yeah, it's way too from rough my, to act i think a, the issue i think you know speaking at the end of this like I love your intuition. I love your thinking. Uh, I think there's people who would like your mathematical approach, you know, and your physical intuition. I think just in terms of exposition, and I think also like it's all right to have rough drafts and then, you know, we'll do, yeah. we do it. Over. That's what we can do. And I think that's very good. That's fine. I just that's think as a strategy, uh, pedagogically, like if we could start off, like where you write your agenda, you see saying like, these are the five steps I want to go through, yeah. right? Because you, we're on this odyssey. I have nowhere, no idea where we're going. You see, if I kind of knew the agenda, then I'd know, okay, let's get there faster. Or like, no, we're only going to get this so far today or whatever it is, yeah, right? Sure. That's the, and then I think, um, so I think that, and then um, in this particular subject, like I do better, I think, if I get to see, the big picture and if i get to see the contrast like what's the problem you see like with quantum like if i was thrown into the quantum and you see like this is what you have to deal with that helps me think better than to say well this is what we know right like i am not interested in what we know you know i'm interested in, like what is confusing right and well, so the more you explain what we know the more i get confused like why is this important? Like, why is this relevant? You know, because it's kind of just machinery. Yeah, so, it is. And, and the things I'm trying to, you know, like in things like this, I'm trying to um, build up like a, 
a base a base vocabulary so that when we yeah. translate to quantum we have some handles like we have some we have some uh you know we could say oh well that's a random variable in classical what's it going to look like in quantum it's going to look exactly the same only this is going to be a projection in fact it is a projection in classical um you see so i think like just pedagogic like you know we have conflicting interests like your interest is to kind of like go back to the classical and see what it looks like in the simpler form and get that foundation built whereas pedagogically for me like if you would have said uh uh i'll show you the quantum in the quantum case it's projections then i go well what is that then you say okay well projections in the classical case is just an indicator function you see yeah. then it's much easier for me to understand and yeah. at least i feel like you know also because pedagogically i will never understand things the first time around anyways yeah so you see if you dump me into the quantum case at least i learn about projections and i think about projections you see and i know what to think about i can think about what i don't understand yeah but i understand indicator function so i just don't understand like what are we what are we talking about you see because i don't understand like what are we trying to what are we talking about i understand everything i think right so i've seen this before right so i think that's um pedagogically that's just let me think the my personal comment yeah but there's i mean i you know i wrote like seven pages for myself in preparation mm -hmm. that i really needed to write out maybe 20 or 30. um yeah and, and the reason is because as i'm going through it and i'm like trying to consolidate notation and all that kind of stuff and and it is a, each time I write down something new, I realize that, you know, there's some analog in the classical case mm -hmm. uh, that makes me want to reformulate the way I'm talking about classical. Um, but I'm still not giving up on the idea that starting from classical and just, you know, you know, I like the idea. Anyway, you know, it. I think that once this whole thing is over, we can talk about the overall structure. Right. And but then, then I think uh, I, I think uh, also like uh, it's just very helpful that you're getting this out, that you're writing the notes, that you're presenting to me. I'm learning, you're teaching, and we're benefiting. So this probably it's just the two of us, I think, basically. But uh, yeah, and you know, what I anyone with, who can find us, you know, that's uh, exciting too. But uh, what I did with complex numbers probably was twenty hours of distillation and. You know, mm -hmm. because I had to prepare it for a lecture I gave a few years ago. And um, that's just kind of the way I am. Like, I, I <laughs> it, to get a cogent um, exposition takes me quite some time. And I thought we'd just jump in together. I, sorry if this was less productive than you thought it was. No, no, it was, well, I think um, it raised pedagogical questions. That's all I'm thinking. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, just to know, conclude, I would want to thank... Anything more you want to say, and I'll just thank no, we'll you. Go on to, we'll we'll start from here next time, and we'll go on and just start developing a different way of viewing this thing probabilistically, using using these inspirations, and um, you'll see that it it bears a lot in common with with classical probability. Um, it, there's not that much difference, um, and uh, some people call it quantum you know, probability, whatever, um, you know, they, they have a different name for it. Quantum Boolean algebra. In fact, this one author, Griffiths, Robert Griffiths, um, says it's really not. It's not a different probability theory. It's exactly the same probability theory. It's just your basic mm -hmm. algorithm. And um, so, you know that's kind of what where I wanted to. T I, I was hoping we'd get to it together so we could discuss that because it's not entirely one hundred percent distilled in my mind. We have different authors disagreeing on different fundamentals, and you know I thought that we'd kind of explore that together. And so we're doing that, and so uh, it's very meaningful uh, to do this ahead of your trip to Lithuania because it gives me time to absorb yeah. it, right? So then I'll yeah. maybe be up and running when you come. And uh, I thank God, I thank you uh, for uh, sharing this uh, intellectual adventure and uh, uh, making it uh, possible not to be alone, you know, to be with each other, to be friends. And yeah. so the same with anyone who made it this far with us. Welcome.
Peace yeah. and love. So to be continued, right? Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. It took me all of three minutes to go to Patreon to find Math for Wisdom and to sign up. And now I'm a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom. It was that easy. So all you gotta do is just what I said, go there, couple minutes, boom, it's done. Try it.